because of yeah. the community. Uh, yeah. No, and actually, uh, I, f speaking for myself, I'm very happy that we've managed to integrate uh, forestry in our architecture school. Uh, so there was this long discussion whether it should remain a standalone and it was a kind of orphan uh, within the University of Toronto. And uh, then we had the opportunity to uh, make it part of our school. And I think yes. it's just amazing because, the, the, let's say, the, the connection is so obvious. And particularly also in the kind of Canadian mindset uh -huh. where everything is forced and there are a few cities. It's really important to kind of get yes. this understanding that it's part of the city and uh, it's part of the urban culture. Mm. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah, I, I yeah. look forward to, to the event very much. Yeah. So we are going to have a, a surely an interesting uh, discussion. Yeah. Well, I keep an eye on it. Twenty <laughs> second of October. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. <laughs> I write it down right away. <laughs> Which link, Fabiano? Give us the link. <laughs> I will. I don't have it yet. Uh, as soon as I get it, I will, I will share it. Yeah. So that we can listen. You, you don't need the flight tickets, but you need links. Yes. <laughs> I will circulate. <laughs> so I guess uh, if you agree, we can uh, we can start if uh, Hans agrees. Okay, yeah. other students are I guess uh, joining us later. Opening uh, well, good afternoon everybody. First of all, I want also to say hello to some uh, colleagues and professor I can see in, in the participants. So I give uh, you a welcome in our. Uh, LOL uh, landscape of limits LOL lecture. So today Sarah asked me to, to introduce uh, our uh, lecture number four and uh, it's definitely a great honor okay by one side because I mean it's always a pleasure to, to join uh, into these discussions uh, and uh, within our workshop I, I think we had uh, a great series of uh, discussion of lectures and uh, I hope everybody is uh, satisfied with that and by the, by the other side because uh, Hans Siebeling, so our tonight guest and lecturer, is uh, I mean, it's a very interesting and deep uh, personality in the international culture about architecture and design. I had uh, the, the opportunity, I mean, the, the good luck to meet uh, him uh, sometime. One uh, of it, uh, some years ago, we have invited him in, uh, in our campus in Piacenza, so he knows uh, something about also the, the site of our, of our project. And uh, then we met sometimes in uh, Biennale, in Venice, in other, in other occasion. I always admired his ability to, to know everything from architectural culture from all over the world. Um, well, in our series of lectures, we have started uh, last, uh, last Monday, we have uh, shifted from designers to critic, uh, to critic and theorists in architecture. And, uh, and tonight we are exactly in the field of uh, uh, of ideas. Okay, so uh, you can read uh, in the chat uh, the um, uh, Hans uh, biography. Uh, I want just to, to, to figure out, to point out some uh, topical points. Uh, he's Dutch, so in the Netherlands he started some years ago an innovative path in communicating architecture through uh, the architecture observer. So it is uh, uh, something, in, uh, so a sort of media experiment about architecture, mainly with issues of uh, landscape, public space, also artificial landscapes. Now, uh, as uh, he was uh, telling us before opening the session, he lives uh, beyond the ocean, so he, he lives in Canada, where he teaches at the, at the University of Toronto. And uh, I repeat, it's a great observer of what's happening worldwide in the field of architecture. This is, uh, I think it's fantastic by this point. Uh, in these uh, years, in the last years, I guess, uh, but now he's uh, focusing better about this point, he's focusing about uh, what is the most impacting uh, question in our contemporary age. So the, the uh, global warming and the climatic change. So in the perspective of, of history, if an, an architecture is researching connection and impacts of architecture and climatic uh, change. So our architecture is impacted, impacted our architecture is impacting this, uh, this question. So when uh, we have proposed him to, to come to our workshop to give us uh, a lecture, uh, I ask, uh, what, uh, Hans, what do you want to talk about? Uh, and uh, I said, he gave a very precise title to the to his lecture to the lecture. So, land, water, air, planetary architecture. So, Hans, 
We still thank you very much for being a part of our experience. And uh, I give you the floor for this, what I, I suppose is a fantastic worldwide discussion about architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michaela. I'm going to try to open my. Uh, let me see, what do I do? Uh, I'm going to go to my desktop and I hope you are able to see my slides. Is it working? We can see, we do. OK, well, thank you very much for inviting me, Michaela. It's always nice to be in Piacenza. Uh, even if it's a uh, long distance from Montreal, where I am uh, today. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, my current interest in planetary architecture. And um, I'm not going to say too much about uh, the pole or uh, the relation between Piacenza and the pole, but uh, it will occur implicitly several times uh, during this uh, presentation. Um, I'm working on a book, so this is kind of a, a, a placeholder of what I'm writing now, um, an outline of a global warming history of modern architecture, um, which is based on the idea that the Industrial Revolution, which is often seen as the starting point of modern architecture, is also uh, the beginning of global warming as we currently understand it. So this, the beginning of the Anthropocene coincides with the beginning of modern architecture and what I'm trying to do, and I'm going to discuss some of the points <coughs> of this today, is the relation between global warming and modern architecture. <coughs> it's part of this kind of uh, um, progress in thinking, uh, uh, which I see in uh, architectural history, that for a long time during the 20th century, we've been uh, dealing with conventional histories, which were uh, focusing on the West, on Europe and North America, and describing modern architecture in terms of uh, progress and growth and a, in a very optimistic way. Then since the late 80s, early 90s, there's this rise of uh, a different perspective of global history. Uh, which was not dealing with the West only, but was covering larger parts of the world. And it coincides with this postmodern uh, perspective, uh, which was uh, questioning the uh, uh, dominance of the West and the questioning of the dominance of modernism. And I feel that uh, this is gradually shifting into uh, a different perspective again of a planetary history uh, which is not dealing with the world, but with the earth. And if I have to describe it in other terms, I would use the term metamodern, uh, which is a kind of uh, faltering uh, ism, which is not completely developed yet. Uh, but I do like it, and I think it has uh, qualities and values. Um, Andre Fulani, writing about literature, uh, described it as an attitude of after yet by means of modernism. And this uh, aligns with what Annie Pedre has written about Team 10 uh, a while ago, where she said that Team 10 was committed to and critical of modern architecture in this kind of double position, using uh, the means of modernism yet being critical about it and using the means to be critical about it is, uh, I think, helpful for an understanding of uh, our current situation. <clears throat> and just to give you one example how it could work, this is a building in the Netherlands where I'm from, uh, a famous uh, modern project designed by Dan Duiker and Bernard Bijvoet, uh, uh, Sunbeam uh, Sanatorium, which was uh, developed for the treatment of uh, patients with tuberculosis uh, for whom uh, exposure to fresh air and sunlight was uh, highly beneficial. Um, the interesting part here, and this is uh, that the uh, building was financed by the workers in the diamond industry uh, who were maybe disproportionately suffering lung diseases because of their work. 
and there is this connection between this building and uh, colonialism because this diamond industry in Amsterdam relied on the South African mines and this is the big Kimberley mines which were uh, well, let's say beginning to be explored in the 1870s and then there is a third layer which you can add which is a planetary history where you can see the effect of this mining um, and the environmental destruction in South Africa all to make the point that you can see this beautiful building in a conventional history as a masterpiece of modern architecture period and nothing else in the global history you can see that it's indirectly connected to this colonial exploitation of South Africa and then in a planetary history there's this awareness of what it uh, entails for the environment and so this is let's say part of what i'm trying to do in my global history of architecture uh, global warming history of architecture and uh, of course i'm not uh, the first to propose this and i'm not the only one there are many people who are dealing with this uh, and what really this is from um, failed architecture great uh, uh, projects based in the netherlands uh, where the connection was uh, uncovered or revealed between the Guggenheim, uh, known for their um, uh, as patrons of the arts, uh, and uh, the uh, mining uh, in, uh, in this case Chile, and uh, so part of the wealth of the Guggenheim family comes from. Uh, destroying the environment and this kind of double layer is for me uh, one of the aspects and what you can say is that <clears throat> there is this creative destruction of modern architecture uh, but there's also a destructive creativity which of course uh, relies on this notion of uh, Schumpeter of uh, creative destruction as being um, central to uh, capitalism this idea that architecture is on the one hand a creative enterprise but on the other hand a destructive one is something that uh, not everyone is uh, already willing to uh, acknowledge and embrace and I think there is this kind of interesting dilemma that there are two sides of the coin uh, that modern architecture is good for humans but bad for humankind good for humans but bad for all other species and maybe good for the world but bad for the planet and this um, is expressed for instance in this book published in 1972 where uh, architecture was described as uh, the destruction of the natural environment uh, 1972 and just to come back once more to Schumpeter, this is the famous quote from uh, the book the Austrian uh, economist wrote in 1942, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy, where he says that uh, it's interesting that he speaks of this in uh, biological terms, kind of uh, using a natural perspective to describe how the uh, economy of capitalist countries is based on the uh, incessant destruction of old structures uh, and this process of creative destruction is essential for capitalism. The idea that uh, humans are destroying uh, the environment uh, was first noticed, maybe perhaps first uh, publicized by uh, George Perkins Marsh in uh, 1864 when he published his book Men and Nature or Physical Geography as Modified by Human Action. Later editions of the book had a slightly different title, uh, The Earth as Modified by Human Action, and it's returned to the original title uh, in the second half of the 20th century. <clears throat> this is the first account of uh, the impact of humans on the surface of the earth and this is a kind of a description uh, acknowledging the uh, anthropogenic uh, 
impact on our environment. And this, I think, relates to uh, what uh, you are uh, exploring in your uh, virtual workshop, namely the relation between the city and the river. Here are some pictures from the uh, European Space Agency where you see the Po Valley and um, the river, I think, is uh, something that uh, is perhaps more complicated than it usually uh, is usually uh, uh, perceived as uh, in uh, studies of architecture, urbanism and landscape. Yeah. I noticed that there was relatively little published uh, recently on the uh, Po and the quality of the water of the Po and its kind of uh, environmental uh, uh, situation. I came across this from 2007, uh, which was a kind of Po basin case study uh, where they were looking at the quality of the water. And what you see here is that the surface water quality is affected by various problems and the flow reduction, which you see in the third sentence, is uh, one of the main issues that creates uh, all the uh, environmental problems downstream. And uh, I was struck by this uh, um, observation that the flow reduction of the natural capacity uh, is uh, kind of essential in the problems of the river. Uh, here we see, by the way, that um, you see that downstream, the red dots is where the surface water quality is lower. You can see that downstream it's even worse than it is uh, upstream. And Piacenza in the middle is, um, let's say, not too bad, but it's surrounded by places where the quality is really low. Um, this free flow of the river uh, reminded me uh, of this Universal Declaration of the Rights of Rivers, which was drafted in 2017, where you see under uh, point one, the right to flow. Flows must at minimum be sufficient to maintain the ecosystem health of the entire river system. So this idea that um, a river as uh, legal rights is uh, slowly uh, getting traction and I think it's extremely important to help us to reconceptualize our relationship with the uh, with our environment and there's the right of the river to perform essential functions within its ecosystem and uh, even if you are dealing with uh, transforming the land surrounding your river, you still, I think, have to acknowledge the right of the river to perform uh, essential functions like flooding. And to understand the value of the river, I want to go back to um, Elysée Reclus, uh, the uh, geographer from the 19th century, human geographer, who wrote this history of a stream where he says uh, that uh, the river is still able to uh, instill a kind of religious uh, terror uh, because we have not been able to uh, uh, constrain it, uh, restrain it, sorry. And uh, it's uh, almost like it's a a child of Neptune, uh, which is uh, instead of a kind of friendly stream, it is this kind of uh, horrific figure in the landscape. And I think um, Reclus was describing the destruction of uh, the stream when it became the river, when it would enter the city and become polluted, but he was still able to see this uh, kind of uh, natural power, uh, almost mythological power of the river. If you think that rivers have rights, then uh, this is certainly an infringement of the rights of the river. Uh, this is a bit downstream from uh, Piacenza. And even if you see this as a kind of uh, 
well designed, uh, well engineered uh, invention, it is an infringement of the rights of the river, which is no longer allowed to uh, flow freely here. Um, the European Space Agency has all kinds of images of the region, and I've been looking at them up just to give you an idea of here we have the uh, kind of air pollution uh, through methane, one of the uh, most powerful greenhouse gases. You see the smog, this is from NASA by the way, but you see the smog in the valley. You can see how the valley is kind of uh, like a magnet of uh, smog. You see nitrogen dioxide, which is uh, one of the uh, key pollutants from agriculture. And here you see it on the European scale. So I think even if you zoom in on the smallest scale of uh, your exact location in Piacenza, close to uh, the river, it's part of this much larger environmental system, obviously, where this uh, air pollution is just one aspect of it. Maybe we zoom out, we get a chance to see the whole of Italy with this light pollution of uh, Napoli on the right, uh, Rome in the middle, and then the Po Valley in the north. And it makes us aware that's one of the qualities of uh, space travel of our uh, planetary confinement and condition. Here we see Northern Europe with the Netherlands on the left, uh, where I spent most of my life. And it reminds of this image. This is an um, enlargement of a part of an image of uh, Bruno Taut, who published in 1919 his book uh, Alpine Architecture in Germany. And uh, this image of the planet, uh, image of the Earth is extremely powerful for me as uh, a reflection of Bruno Taut's awareness of this kind of uh, of the planet, basically. And I think it's also interesting that the book is called Alpine Architecture, but it's not about the Alps only. It's about uh, the Earth, the crust of the Earth, the uh, tactile materiality of the Earth, the uh, existence of the earth in uh, a much larger uh, context. And what's striking is that um, Taut was making this image uh, prior to any photography of the earth, which had to wait until 1968 when the astronaut William Anders made this image of uh, the earth rise uh, while traveling uh, near the moon, which you see in the foreground. And this image, slightly tilted, was also on the cover of Richard Buckman's Apollo's book, uh, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. Not on the first edition, which you see at the bottom, where the head of um, Buckman's Apollo himself was uh, taken as a, a kind of a, a planet uh, on this cover. Um, this idea of Spaceship Earth, which was uh, coined by Buckman Fuller, but published prior to his own book, uh, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, already in 1966 by Barbara Ward, um, marks, together with this picture of Earthrise, marked this moment of a kind of planetary awareness, which was more or less absent. And obviously, in the case of uh, Richard Buckman's Fuller, there was this uh, firm belief that uh, geoengineering uh, was uh, crucial and essential for this operating manual, that it was uh, a kind of technological uh, manual, basically, for the operation of the Earth. Uh, and not so much an environmental one. However, it was also around this time that the first, first Earth Day was uh, celebrated 
and uh, this was of course this key moment of uh, kind of environmental awareness that started to rise uh, which is for instance reflected here on the cover of the uh, unesco magazine courrier where there was this uh, candle of the earth uh, with the poles being flames and this kind of leaking uh, of the candle on the earth and a kind of um, reflection of this idea that there are limits to growth to refer to a famous publication from 1972. Slightly earlier, in a kind of celebration of uh, Marsh's uh, book Men and Earth, uh, a large conference was held, which was sponsored by uh, this uh, Wenner Grant Foundation for Anthropological Research. Um, a kind of key moment for me in this history of this uh, architecture and uh, planetary awareness, as you can see, it was edited by uh, three people, one of them being the uh, important uh, critic and historian uh, Lewis Mumford. And it contains several contributions which are dealing with uh, the architectural and urbanistic aspects of the role of humans in changing the face of the earth. Typically for the time, it's still man's role in changing the face of the earth because it was this kind of absence of gender neutral descriptions in the period. But it's the focus on man's role or on the human's role is maybe typical for the thinking of the time, which is also uh, illustrated this image from uh, Victor Orgiai's book Design with Climate, which is one of the very first uh, comprehensive attempts to uh, describe uh, the climatic aspects of architecture, which were hardly taken into account uh, prior to that. Uh, and it's really striking to see illustration number 34, where his uh, center of the universe is a human uh, figure and the caption man as the central measure of arch in architecture is uh, quite telling. It reminds everyone obviously of uh, this image of um, Da Vinci, the Vitruvian man being the center of the world and this image uh, is now rapidly being eroded. Now we're having a much more uh, non-human centric understanding of the world, um, which leads us to a larger scale, which was already anticipated by Bruno Taut, or to a smaller scale uh, when you look at uh, the uh, level of individual cells. I think it's uh, a very humbling thought that human beings uh, consist mainly uh, as colonies of other uh, cells, sort of the 30 trillion cells in your body, less than one third is human and the rest is uh, bacterial fungal. So we're not human beings, we're just like the uh, vessels for trillions and trillions of um, bacteria. Um, to continue with Bruno Taut, in uh, Alpine architecture, he goes to this uh, uh, galactical scale, but he also zooms in and looks at the mountains. And the mountains, I think, are extremely uh, relevant for any discussion of a global warming history of modern architecture, because uh, since the early 19th century, the mountains became a kind of uh, stand-in, uh, a symbol for the uh, earthly character of the earth and uh, it's one of the places where uh, people could get a very direct and uh, uh, visceral experience of the earth and for me it might be a reason to reconsider this building which is often used as a kind of uh, precursor of the transparency that would dominate modern architecture in the 1920s and 30s. 
And instead of seeing this as uh, a glass building, it's called a glass pavilion, I think it has more to do. It can also be read perhaps as uh, a crystal which directly relates to the uh, mountainous environment he was describing in um, Alpine architecture. And one possible connection is this uh, undated drawing by Eugène Violet Le Duc, who was also looking at the Alps and try to understand the kind of geometry of uh, the Mont Blanc. And this idea of the mountain as a crystal, uh, the an architecture which reflects the shapes of crystal is uh, very potent to me. The um, interest in the mountains is also uh, visible in the work of John Ruskin, who is usually seen as the kind of uh, reactionary uh, anti-modernist who uh, lamented the uh, transformation of uh, Europe and England in particular uh, due to the industrialization and uh, I think his uh, position needs to be uh, reconsidered at least and I think there's a very interesting aspect to his work especially his lecture in two parts which he gave in the uh, 1880s which uh, is called the storm cloud of the 19th century where based on his own observations of the weather in England over a period of almost half a century, he came to the conclusion that uh, there was uh, not only a change in the weather, but it was more fundamental. And he tried to give an artistic interpretation of uh, climate change without calling it climate change, but calling it the storm cloud of the 19th century. And this is also why he was so attracted to the mountains because here there was still it's kind of pristine quality of clean air, uh, which also led to the formation of well-defined clean clouds instead of the polluted ones he saw in England. This direct relationship with the landscape, with the mountain landscape, is uh, more or less absent, you could say, in uh, the uh, most of the highlights of modern architecture. I think it's quite striking. This is from a publication from 1954 about this house that Le Corbusier designed for his mother uh, close to uh, Montreux in the 1920s, early 1920s, that you can see here that the location of the house on uh, the Lac Léman, the uh, Geneva, is uh, shown in a, in a very distant way. There's this eye looking at the mountains uh, on the other side of Avion without any direct contact. And this kind of disconnect is uh, maybe typical for this inability of modern architecture to engage with um, the uh, landscape and hence with the planetary conditions. Same here, um, this uh, view of Rio de Janeiro, which is framed by a window, which again uh, keeps the observer uh, at bay and the landscape at bay, keeping this distance between the two. Um, so right now I'm collecting all those projects where I see a kind of understanding uh, of this relationship with the earth, including this uh, visionary plan of Hendrik Weideveld, a Dutch uh, expressionist architect who came with a plan to plan the impossible which was a 15 mile deep uh, hole in the earth, uh, which would offer an encounter, a direct experience with the planet. Uh, back to the air, uh, because I think uh, the development of um, planes is uh, interesting as well, kind of, uh, balloons, planes, uh, the possibility to leave the earth and to fly is uh, maybe one of the hidden motives of uh, the Eiffel Tower where Gustav Eiffel designed his private apartment for himself at the top, which is relatively tiny. He used this for uh, meteorological uh, observations 
um, which was one of his, his interests. He's, he's very interested in, in wind. And uh, this looks very much like uh, this capsule that uh, is an illustration in one of Jules Verne's books uh, from Earth to the Moon, which has this kind of similar uh, setup of this tiny little capsule. And from an article by Gina Green, I have these illustrations uh, of this kind of um, iconography of the late 19th century with this idea of traveling to the North Pole in a balloon and in, in a very uh, tight setting, kind of flying barn, which contained uh, livestock, uh, living quarters and a kind of uh, studio or lab. And all speaks of the um, uh, the fascination for uh, being disconnected from the earth and then flying to the north pole is even more uh, uh, symbolically loaded i think because it was one just like the mountains and the ocean uh, one of the and uh, the desert one of the unexplored parts of the world where you could actually experience the earth and the planetary implications of it the idea of flying continues with this famous plan of uh, uh, Krutikov for the flying city, uh, a kind of a visionary idea of being completely disconnected from the surface of the planet and by being disconnected, making the Earth even more, uh, uh, more present. And here we have uh, Richard Putman's Fuller again, together with Shoji Sadao, Cloud9 project, where he believed that if you would make those spheres big enough uh, and make them completely airtight, the uh, air, the sunlight would warm up the air within those enormous uh, spheres and, and they would uh, lift off and leave the planet. The background, the Rocky Mountains in this case, is again highly symbolic and stressing this kind of uh, of prehistoric context of this um, highly technolo technological uh, feat. The perspective from the air certainly has changed um, the awareness of the planet. And uh, Erwin Goodkind, one of the lesser known people in the history of modern architecture, plays an important role here. He moved from Europe uh, to North America, and he stayed in many places only for a short while, so he never got this complete uh, professional network around him, which made him somehow isolated. But I think his Our World from the Air is uh, an extremely important publication because it's dealing with how we perceive, uh, survey man and his environment, how we perceive uh, the the planet and understand the role of humans in it. Uh, part of the exploration of air is also capturing air. Uh, the dome over Manhattan, designed by Buckminster Fuller, Fuller, is one example of this. This led to this dropout city as well, which I'm not going to talk about. But here we have another kind of protective layer of Kenzo Tange uh, and Frei Otto together. The idea of the city in the Arctic, kind of enormous dome creating a city in the uh, polar environment. And this goes back, we go back to the 19th century, to Joseph Paxton's Crystal Palace. And this is another building which I believe um, deserves kind of multiple uh, interpretations. It's uh, a key building in the history of modern architecture because of its prefabrication, the use of modular elements of uh, iron and glass, uh, which enabled this extremely fast construction of this very large building. But I think there's also a kind of environmental history uh, which deserves uh, attention. First of all, the building was uh, modified to uh, enable the protection of some large elms in uh, Hyde Park to uh, survive. And they actually survived until the 1970s. 
uh, when the Dutch elm disease uh, finally killed them. Uh, but the fact that this building is uh, accepting and acknowledging nature in this way is extremely interesting. But the other aspect is that for uh, Joseph Paxton, the Crystal Palace was also a kind of uh, air conditioned uh, or conditioned environment. He uh, devised a very complicated uh, ventilation system, which not always worked well, but here you see just above the arches everywhere, you can see uh, parts of this uh, ventilation system uh, in place. <clears throat> and here we see uh, how this ventilation system uh, looks in uh, section and elevation. And it's the idea to protect the visitors of the Crystal Palace from the environment also plays a role in this magnificent uh, project of Paxton for the Great Victorian Way, um, which uh, he developed a few years later, which was on the one hand an infrastructural gesture to accommodate the train traffic, which you see on the far left and the far right of the section and uh, the additional effect and for him the most important one was that it would uh, create this completely covered street the parallel to the train tracks so this would be a system for a ring road in the center of london which you see here is this kind of uh, uh, a mobile like uh, uh, shape which would entail a total of 16 kilometers of covered archway where people could walk and uh, live uh, protected from the very polluted air of London. There is another environmental aspect of the Crystal Palace which is super interesting. It's not only that it's uh, reused, so that's highly sustainable uh, building that could have a second life in uh, uh, Sydenham in 1854 in the south of London when it was rebuilt in a different form uh, as an exhibition building which lasted until it burned down in the 1930s. Uh, you will see it in its uh, second iteration when it was larger than the original one um, to house all kinds of exhibitions. Uh, and here, I think another interesting aspect in the light of this global warming history uh, is that it allows for a kind of different perceptions of time. So the building itself is uh, a feat of uh, the modern era uh, using uh, the products of uh, uh, industry. Inside there was a historical display which showed a kind of history of humankind and then a lesser known part outside, which you see here at the, can you still, no, you cannot see it here, it's at, the, at the bottom of this uh, image, there is a part of this large park surrounding uh, the Crystal Palace, which was devoted to uh, prehistory. And here you see images of what was actually built and constructed, where large uh, one-to-one -one, uh, models of what were uh, believed the forms of uh, dinosaurs uh, at that time and were placed in a landscape uh, on top of pieces of rock uh, from different parts of the um, uh, Great Britain and those rocks were actually uh, the rocks where the fossils were found, uh, layers of fossils of the uh, large animals that were on display here. So there was a kind of uh, uh, scientific accuracy in this representation of prehistory. And I think it's for me uh, a very fascinating project where the uh, modern era of uh, the Crystal Palace comes together with this historical display of uh, uh, um, uh, humankind and this deep time part of history uh, of this uh, with this display of dinosaurs. And again, this reflects a kind of um, 
planetary awareness, which is also uh, crucial for this great globe, which was built on the occasion of um, the um, great exhibition for which the Crystal Palace was built. And this was placed in Leicester Square, so-called Wilt's Great Globe. Wilt was a map maker uh, who wanted to give uh, the English public the chance to experience uh, the world in uh, one view. And this kind of panorama of the world by the uh, surface of the earth is put on the interior of the globe. It was one of many globe projects that uh, kept 19th century uh, entrepreneurs, uh, geographers and architects busy. It goes back maybe to this uh, fantastic project of uh, Boulet for the cenotaph for Newton, which shows the um, a burial place for the great Isaac Newton uh, under this uh, starry sky. Um, the first globe in this traditional globe was built in 1822 in Paris, where you can see a relatively small globe, which allowed people to have this view of the planet. Uh, and the sheer existence of these globes, these projects, uh, reveal a kind of planetary awareness starting in the early uh, 19th century. There was a large globe an exterior one um, at the uh, expo for which the Eiffel Tower was built. And then a few years later, the next edition, the Universal Exhibition of 1900, there was uh, this Galeron project, project for a celestial globe, uh, which is part of the same tradition. During this um, expo, Elisee Reclus, the same uh, human geographer who I just quoted about the stream and the river, was trying to build a uh, globe as well. And here we see two versions of his project for this uh, globe, which you hope to achieve in 1900. Eventually, he asked the famous uh, Art Nouveau architect uh, Louis Bonnier to make this design. Uh, Bonnier is actually the one who designed this Art Nouveau gallery, um, which gave the movement its name in Paris. Um, and one fascinating aspect about Élysée Reclus, and he was not the only one, is that there is this um, um, anarchist ideology behind his uh, geography. And um, for him, uh, the vision of the planet, the, the, the image of the planet, the awareness of the planet uh, implied also a kind of extreme uh, form of equality. And uh, just like Peter Kropotkin, another anarchist slash geographer, there is a very interesting stream of thinkers uh, in the late 19th century of uh, combining geography with anarchism. And I think if you go back to this uh, draft version of the Declaration of the Rights of Rivers, there is also this kind of anarchist uh, attitude in that, that there is no authority accepted uh, on the river. The river should flow as it wants to flow, just like people should inhabit the world as they want it uh, in terms of uh, uh, what kind of society they want to form in the eyes of reclus. And this kind of continuous reference to images uh, to, of the globe is uh, crucial for Élysée reclus and his understanding of human geography. Uh, the humanist to nature uh, uh, is nature uh, taking uh, uh, conscience of itself. And we see the image comes from this book, uh, L'homme et la terre, uh, the man and the earth. And this is uh, an image uh, illustration made by the Czech uh, artist uh, Francis Kupka, who moved to Paris. And again, this is very interesting that we see um, 
the Earth, the planet in uh, the galaxy and uh, framed by geography on the left and history on the right, which were for him the two crucial elements of human geography. We're getting to the end. One more globe which never took off, uh, the steel globe tower, uh, which was supposed to be built on Coney Island, but it was uh, more of a scam than a real project. Uh, but it's, again, maybe a reflection of this kind of uh, a mix of the planetary awareness and this idea of creating kind of uh, protected environments, because as you can see, the top part of the globe is uh, kind of uh, interior nature landscape. Um, it's interesting to see that um, Elysee Reclusi idea of uh, kind of anarchism uh, somehow transpired eventually in the World's Fair of New York 1964, which had its theme peace through understanding which could have been a quote from Elysee Reclus and had this large globe as its centerpiece. So again, this idea of this planetary awareness, this uh, belief that we're all part of the same system plays out here. And it's fascinating to see that actually through this kind of very commercialized uh, environment that those planetary ideas again uh, get shaped. Uh, General Motors in its pavilion, at its famous pavilion in 1939, uh, which is uh, designed by Bel Geddes. Uh, this one is lesser known, but more interesting for uh, a planetary history of uh, modern architecture, where you can see the way those panoramas, uh, dioramas of uh, different landscapes and the uh, future uh, of them and here we see the desert which very much looks like Mars or the imagination of what Mars could be and here we see the Arctic, Antarctic uh, developed so this is basically the same kind of environments that were explored uh, throughout the late 19th century by uh, forward thinking uh, geographers and uh, artists Underwater, which is another kind of uh, territory which uh, is beyond the regular uh, Earth life. And then, of course, this outer space, which is uh, reflected in this uh, diorama. And um, the connection between planetary experiences of the desert and the mountains and this uh, 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 experience in space on other planets is, uh, I think, very much correlated as well. So this kind of uh, uh, image, this kind of imagination of uh, the planet is uh, fueled by this imagination of other planets like Mars. Um, I don't have a real conclusion. Uh, of my story yet, but I think it's interesting to uh, contemplate how many uh, more recent design proposals are integrating this idea of uh, the planet and uh, uh, interplanetary, uh, extraplanetary uh, conditions as well. Like here, uh, Alessandro Poli's uh, uh, highway between the Earth and the Moon as part of the uh, super studio adventure uh, in the late 60s, early 1970s. And over here, uh, slightly later, Rem Cole has together with Madelon Friesendorp, the city of the captive globe as part of uh, Delirious New York, which is not only referencing uh, super studio, which you see on the right, but also the idea of the captive globe, which is kind of the inversion of the story I've been telling that uh, we are captured by the globe. Here the globe is capturing, is captured by the city. And uh, all I'm trying to say with this, leading me to this conclusion of this uh, presentation is that uh, for me, it's interesting to see if we can develop a different perspective on um, 
the uh, relationship between architecture and environment, architecture and um, uh, uh, the planet, and not in terms of making architecture more sustainable, which is just like another chapter to the history of progress as it was started, uh, the beginning of modern architecture in the 1800s, but a, a truly different understanding uh, of a non-human centric uh, worldview and uh, what the role of architecture could possibly be there. And I want to conclude with this image, which um, is again from Kohas and Friesendorp, the story of the pool, uh, an image, uh, almost like an emblem of uh, a narrative developed by Kohas uh, about Russian constructivist architects uh, escaping the Soviet Union in the 1930s by swimming, uh, facing Europe, and while swimming, moving their floating swimming pool towards North America which was for him a story about uh, how modern architecture uh, was crossing the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, going from Europe uh, to North America, while the, uh, let's say, the uh, perspective remained uh, uh, European. But I think this idea of architecture floating on the ocean, uh, that physical action of human beings uh, is transforming um, the uh, surface of the earth is almost like uh, an emblem of the subtitle of uh, man and nature of uh, George Perkins Marsh, uh, physical geography as modified by human action. So it's kind of physical action, physical human action transforming the earth. And uh, I hope that my uh, publication will help to raise an understanding of how human action is actually transforming this uh, surface, not only the surface of the earth, but basically the atmosphere, the lithosphere, the biosphere uh, as well. Um, so I leave it here. I don't know if it will be of any help for you uh, dealing with uh, uh, the relationship between the city of Piacenza and the Po. But uh, I think for me, it's important to uh, raise an awareness of a broader perspective of uh, the history of architecture. OK, thank you very much, Hans. This is the moment of uh, the virtual clapping. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Now I'm opening uh, the, the discussion moment. I want to, to maybe to opening it and waiting for comments uh, by students and questions and so on. Uh, to 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 go back to some of the points you have you have talked during your very I mean refined series of uh, images, and uh, I want to 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 stress uh, your uh, I mean unconventional maybe way to talk about uh, sustainability. Well, uh, you have not talked about uh, sustainability. That is uh, that is. Uh, that is the question, that is the main point. It is important to stress and the, the different perspective of okay, the relationship between architecture and environment is definitely uh, the key. Um, you have also talked about the uh, rights of the river, and this is another strange particular perspective because we can see in the river, so the poor river we are working on, a factor of anarchism, a factor of maybe democracy, a very strange situation where the river itself uh, is creating the, the geography, is creating the plane, but it's also creating the condition for what is uh, incredible pollution. We can see today you have talked about different kinds of, of pollution. And uh, uh, it's also nice that, uh, well, nice, it's uh, interesting and uh, maybe um, suggesting to talk about the uh, architecture on the river. So you have talked about this Isola Serafini um, uh, modification of the of the flows itself uh, that sometimes are seen this type of intervention are seen as something uh, able to uh, bring the nature to to build a different type of nature maybe to uh, build and design the the connection from the river to the city to the city to the river so um, uh, giving the possibility uh, to, to leave the, the river itself, but instead you are saying that they are changing maybe the nature of the river itself. Uh, so I want maybe to, 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 to ask you to go a bit further on this point. So how is it possible to 
to touch the a river as the as the, the Po River close Piacenza, but not changing its own nature. Well, first to go back to your first point about um, uh, sustainability, I think um, there is a tendency in uh, our thinking in the world of architecture that uh, architecture is an improvement. So we're doing something because it's improving the situation, it's improving, it's adding something, it's adding value, it's adding qualities. And this is a kind of thinking which uh, drives this whole history of modern architecture, that modern architecture, every new building was better than the previous one. So we, there's a kind of progress. And strangely enough, even though uh, you could say that postmodernism was questioning this whole narrative of progress, at the same time, there was this kind of implicit idea that a postmodern history was better than a modern history because postmodernists were more inclusive and they were looking at more things and they were not so narrowly narrow minded. Um, and in a way, the understanding of sustainability is again that all the previous buildings were, uh, let's say, energy efficient, uh, wasting material. And now we suddenly have uh, sustainable architecture and that's much better than it was before. So there's always this idea that it's going to be better than before. And um, I think if you are able to zoom out and look at the planetary perspective, it's maybe possible to see it in a different way and not see this kind of marginal improvements in architecture in terms of improvements, but more the kind of devastating impact on the environment. And then it doesn't matter if it's a postmodern building or a modern building or a sustainable or a non-sustainable build. Basically, it's this kind of process of creating through destruction that it's, uh, uh, let's say, essential for our thinking, which goes back, I tr truly believe, to this beginning of the Industrial Revolution, where we started to think that growth and progress are uh, interconnected. So um, even though I think all the, uh, let's say, sustainable uh, initiatives and uh, sustainable thinking is very laudable and commendable and great, I think it's not going far enough. And in the same way, um, coming from a country, the Netherlands, where everything is artificial, where the natural landscape is completely transformed by human beings, um, it's uh, almost impossible to get an understanding of what the natural landscape is. And of course, you could claim, just like Neil Brenner does, that uh, we're now having planetary urbanism, that uh, even what seems to be remote natural landscapes are at the service of the city, of the urban. I think for me personally, going from the Netherlands, which is completely artificial, to Canada, where there are still large parts of the landscapes, which seems to be more natural, uh, has helped me to get a, a better understanding of uh, what nature is and not in an opposition with uh, the urban environment, because it's all part of our uh, let's say, urban experience, but to get, get a better understanding of this idea that um, it's not uh, the obligation of human beings to transform every part of nature into something that is seemingly controlled. And in that sense, I think thinking of the rights of rivers is one way of uh, getting a different understanding of what the river is, because uh, even within the boundaries of uh, uh, the municipality of uh, Piacenza, the river is not part of Piacenza. It's not part, it's part of something which is much larger than that. And uh, it's, it's much more important than that, I would say. Um, so it, it, instead of thinking that you're improving the, the urban by coming up with an intervention in your uh, international workshop, I think it might be interesting to start at the other end and start to think what the river really is and what what you should do to let the river be itself. Not to look, we can say that, not to look uh, at the river in terms of how to design it, but to understand how, what is and what, uh, what, what can be. Yeah. Um, we have received in the, in the chat some question. 
I would like to ask uh, Lisana. Lisana is a student from the our master in uh, Poly Piacenza Campus of Polymy. She's giving uh, you some uh, quite complex three three different questions. But uh, Lisana, maybe you can switch on uh, your camera and give it uh, directly to to Hans. Yeah. That is Lisana. Hello. Hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I think I'm reading your questions right now. So uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well, the first one is I think I saw some discrepancies with the examples that you provided, especially the ones in the olden times. Um, that it seemed like overuse of steel and glass, whereas like the basic planetary um, perspective was about. Um, dealing with the climatic changes of the earth. So that would yeah. be one discrepancy. And the second one is um, some of them also seem a bit utopic or dystopian. Uh, so how do you think like um, what's happening with this idea? Like why um, is it a good or a bad thing, these dystopians and how is it drive? How has the dystopians in the past um, drive changes into this current time and pro possibly in the future? Thanks. Um, well, to start with the first one, I, I think you're totally right that um, on the, uh, if you look at Crystal Palace, uh, then it's obvious that it's it's kind of um, uh, the the footprint of a building uh, uh, like that is enormous. This kind of ecological impact is enormous. Uh, but what I was trying to uh, show is that uh, instead of having this this conventional reading of the Crystal Palace as a modern building because it used prefab elements and used modern materials and it was an architecture without any stylistic references, so it was a kind of pure engineered building. Uh, I think it's also possible to see uh, however flawed and however uh, imperfect that there was also this attempt from the side of Paxton to create this kind of protection from the pollution of the city of London, uh, that there was, especially in this later version in which he was also involved, this kind of time aspect with this confrontation of modern times with this deep time of uh, 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 pre prehistory, you could say. Um, so I'm not saying that a building like Crystal Palace should be seen as a kind of example uh, a kind of template of how you should design a more sustainable form of architecture. But I was trying to uh, argue that there is this um, sustainable thinking hidden in plain sight in this building as well. Um, and uh, this dystopian aspect is uh, <laughs> something which, which is hard to uh, neglect, I think. Uh, but it also depends. Uh, so there are all those failed experiments like Biosphere 2 in Arizona, where they try to make this uh, kind of um, really sustainable environment where people would be able to survive for years uh, uh, growing their own food and uh, without uh, getting any uh, additional uh, fresh air from the outside so that the, the trees in this enormous greenhouse had to produce enough uh, oxygen for people to survive while well, they were almost starving and they had uh, extremely low oxygen levels in their blood at some point so it was kind of uh, impossible to replicate the model of the planet on the scale of uh, a single uh, large building um, so there is a kind of it's almost like inherent that uh, many of those kind of artificial climate projects are uh, almost inevitably failing. Uh, but it's maybe a kind of dark uh, warning for what we are facing, because we have this one planet, which you saw in this image on the cover of this uh, Courrier magazine. We only have one planet and actually we are having a similar experiment as they were having in this biosphere too in uh, the 1980s and 1990s. Um, so whether you call something dystopian or utopian, I think is also 
uh, a matter of uh, taste almost because uh, there is uh, if you think that our current environment is uh, pretty okay I think there's also a deeply dystopian aspect to that as well right now Okay, thank you. We can uh, go on with the uh, Sumaita question. Well, she's giving you, uh, well, uh, thank you for. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I like to, to say that she's defining uh, your approach, not human. Okay, because it, uh, human is an extremely small part of the whole system. So, uh, yeah. That's yeah. The case. Her question oh. is about, uh, uh, maybe you can read, I would like to ask you if you can give any insight about if thinking from this uh, plenary. Planet, planetary perspective can be helpful now that we are in this, I mean, distancing and pandemic moment. So how this uh, uh, pandemic we are uh, passing through is changing also the idea to look from a planetary po point of view. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's a... Uh, uh, so I, I agree that what I was telling was still uh, about humans uh, and their, uh, let's say, impact on the environment. But I think um, there is this, this important shift to this post-humanist or uh, non-human centric understanding uh, of the world. And uh, I think we, we're all really, really slow in realizing it. and getting a better understanding of uh, let's say the uh, fallacy of believing that uh, uh, human um, beings are at the pinnacle of development and the only ones that have the right to decide how we deal with the environment uh, but, but 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 i'm sh sure you're right that i should be stronger in this to make it more uh, evident. Um, regarding the pandemic, uh, I think that's a super difficult question. I can uh, evade the answer by saying I'm an historian, so I have to wait a while. Uh, but that's maybe not fair. Uh, I think it's perhaps helping uh, to raise the awareness of this global interconnectivity and the uh, how everything intersects and uh, it, it is hard because in a way what people are saying now about uh, the pandemic and how they think they, the world will change is all based on a projection of their own uh, ideas they have already so if you are uh, an anarchist, you can see that this shows that uh, uh, the, the rule of national governments is not uh, uh, working. If you are uh, uh, in, uh, let's say, uh, uh, you have an environmental consciousness, you can say that this will be the turning point for air travel. Uh, so everyone is seeing what they want to see. And... Uh, I think it's basically our awareness of this, the planetary scale, uh, which goes beyond the uh, the idea of globalization. So it's not only about the globalization, which we've been discussing since, let's say, the 1990s, but it's much more about uh, this, uh, the because globalization in a, in a way was a very abstract idea, while I think the planetary is very tangible and earthy uh, uh, and concrete. And uh, even though uh, a virus in, is invisible, uh, I think the pandemic offers a very concrete understanding of how we are part of the planet. Okay, thank you. Now we have two comments by Chiara Locardi and Gaia Piccarolo. They both are uh, colleagues and professors at Politecnico. Uh, maybe I can ask also Gaia, if you are there, you can uh, switch on your camera and give uh, give your question. Uh, the Chiara's uh, comment is maybe a little provocative. She says, assuming that architecture is one of the products of this evolution between humans and the environment, 
and assuming the current collapse of this relationship, do you think that it exists some not utopian position? So maybe this, uh, as uh, some colleagues and architects are working about, the only opportunity is probably to uh, uh, and Gaia, maybe you are on, or less on the same line. You can uh, give your yeah. question. Yes. Okay. I, <laughs> I, I can just say that uh, I kind of agree with Chiara. So my question is, in a way, because I already wrote the question, so uh, in a way, it's a, I have different words to say the same concept. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would like to ask if you. Since you are uh, talking a lot about and making a lot of example uh, in a way taken by this tradition that has been going on for a long time, especially in the 60s and 70s, where there is this technological, this topic imagery that is based on, uh, very much on technology and on detachment of uh, architecture from the surface of the art. So in a way, it's not a transformation of the surface of the art uh, in a landscape sense, but uh, it's a way of architecture to be parasite toward to, to act as a parasite toward the surface of the art toward the world mm -hmm. uh, so it's a it's a kind of a, a relation between a human and uh, the world that uh, entails a detachment you know mm -hmm. and so an impossibility no i wanted to to ask if it is a stance in a way toward this idea of an impossibility of architecture to handle these environmental questions that are very urgent of course uh, if not by uh, detaching itself from from the earth and in, instead of acting into it and transforming itself, so transforming yeah. the earth. Well, I think there's now a, a kind of growing body of uh, thinking about this uh, idea of um, uh, leaving earth behind and going to Mars and create this terraforming ideas of uh, how to inhabit uh, uh, another planet. Um, uh, but I think it's still based on the same uh, eco-modernist uh, ideology that technology will be uh, the solution for our uh, environmental uh, predicaments. And um, this whole idea of utopia, this whole idea of uh, uh, this kind of holy grail of something that's better than what we have now is... Um, Part of this growth and progress, it, it driving the, this this idea that we have to continue to to achieve something, and uh, maybe it's also a great moment to realize that there's not so much to achieve. That it's more like uh, maintaining what we have, kind of a stewardship of the planet, kind of uh, instead of uh, creating this false hope, which is implicit in all utopias, this false hope of. Uh, uh, going to Mars and uh, starting new there. I, w I wouldn't go. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> okay, grazie Gaia. And uh, we have Sara. So Sara, yeah. So I also want to thank you for your really inspiring uh, communication. My question is uh, from your planetary view. You know that in the contemporary debate, uh, the question, the, the metaphor of forest uh, is becoming more and more central in defining uh, a new paradigm in this relation between nature and city. In my opinion, also after listening to, to your contribution, this is still working very often in, within this eco-modernist ideology because on one side in the common sense it seems uh, really the perfect solution on the other side uh, behind it uh, you need uh, an incredible investment of uh, transformation money but even a, a very unequal way of organizing nature within the city so i would like to have your opinion about this also uh, since um, our friend fabiano uh, he will come to discuss about forest and city yeah. Um, I think what really strikes me is uh, how often uh, architects are using nature in this very uh, generic way and it's almost like what you see often with first year students of architecture when they start their studies they design uh, a project and then there is something which is completely undefined and green around it and uh, they had, didn't have the time to think of it and, or they didn't have any ideas of what to do with it. But there's this very 
undefined blurry idea of what's green space uh, around the project and in the same way you could say that um, um, there is this um, hope and belief that if it's green if there's something growing around it then it will be fine uh, but I think the uh, the the presence of a tree doesn't mean that there is any kind of uh, environmental logic behind it because it's obviously part of a bigger system and I think Fabiano can chime in and tell us everything about it here uh, so the, the 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 very instrumental character uh, very instrumental understanding of nature is I think another obstacle for designers to 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 fully understand what it means because what do we know about the river what do we know about the, the pole it's just it's it's flowing but what does it mean uh, wh what's the uh, uh, the impact what's the, the the presence what is the 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 consequence of having the river next to the city um, and so in the same way what what's the consequence of having more trees in the city uh, does it really change beyond the uh, production of uh, uh, oxygen or uh, and the capturing of uh, CO2? What, what, what does it mean? And um, so I, I think finding a, a, a better understanding and a more humble understanding of what uh, uh, nature is and what nature in the city is, is uh, uh, quite necessary. Okay, thank you. I don't know if uh, Fabiano wants to add uh, something about this uh, this topic. Okay. You're... Thank you, Michele. No, yes. In fact, I had my my hands up. Um, <laughs> yeah. No. Thank you, Hans, very much for uh, thought provoking lecture. Um, I think I have. Yeah, I have two questions. I think the first one will be perhaps more of a comment, um, and I wanted to hear your opinion uh, about. Uh, the the nature of these difficulty uh, in relating uh, to the planet or relating to Earth, I tend to think that uh, normally uh, when we talk about uh, architecture, we uh, through you know, when we look at uh, our uh, views to construct our own environment historically, there is this uh, dualism between progress and nature, technology and culture the natural and the artifice. And we have these two fields, you know, these two main groups that try to collide and shout a little bit louder than the others, you know, saying, no, we are the right ones, or technology is the solution. Um, and um, on the other side, you have those saying, no, the return to nature, you no know, rusking and so on, uh, actually is the way forward. And if uh, for us, it's not the question of trying to find that uh, what that means, you not know, that integration or that balance, what that actually could mean. Um, I, I, I thought all your examples were fascinating and made me uh, think about a, a few others. You know, um, I, I remember reading uh, Paul uh, Shearbart's book, you know, Glass Architecture, when I was doing my PhD and, and in relationship to Bruno Taut, and I was fascinated by that particular view of nature that sits in a way outside our world, you know, that's out there but it's still beautiful and wonderful. Um, but also we have those that talked about nature inside. You know, we have um, right and alto, we have the whole garden city tradition and so on. So essentially, um, I wonder if this is not a problem of this dualism between rationalism and empiricism mm -hmm. that seems to be pervading our discussions about the theory of architecture, perhaps, you know, um, well, for, for decades at least. So that's the first reflection type of question. And then the second is uh, more about a methodological question regarding your uh, your book. And I'm very interested uh, in your book and I hope it comes out soon we can, uh, so we can uh, read it. And I wonder how you're going to uh, include uh, examples uh, that are non-European, you know, perhaps that what we might call peripheral or peripheral uh, cases, because in fact, we have normally a multiplicity of temporalities. You know? um, if we take the Industrial Revolution as a starting point, that happened, as you know, in many different, uh, in different periods in different countries, and that generated different conditions. You know? So I wanted uh, to know a little bit more about how you intend, if you do, you know, uh, to kind of 
broaden um, the, uh, the scope to cases that perhaps have a little bit of a lag in relationship to that initial starting point. And in, in, well, if, if, if uh, Michael wants me to comment something about the question of uh, nature and, and, and planning, that may take a little bit longer. But um, <laughs> what I would say is that also, um, I think in a way, this question of rationalism and empiricism is also present in the history of planning. But perhaps the question of nature appears slightly differently. Um, but then I think perhaps we can have uh, another another moment for this, uh, for this discussion. It was a commercial for your uh, conference in Toronto. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So it was a rhetorical point, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, it, it, it seems that the, this idea of dualism is, uh, is uh, almost like uh, in our system. And it's really hard to avoid it because it's uh, inside, outside, uh, high, low. Everything is, is, is always in these terms of oppositions. And um, I think it's uh, uh, there are those, uh, let's say, brave attempts to overcome the, this, this uh, contrast between culture and nature or between uh, architecture and the environment, uh, which I think it's interesting. I was reading recently something uh, by a philosopher, Vogel, uh, who writes about how we should uh, stop seeing this kind of contrast between the environment that humans made and the other environment, saying that uh, they're ontologically on the same level. So he says the nature and the shopping mall are basically the same because it's the environments that we experience. Don't know if I'm completely in agreement there, but it, it, I, I think finding ways of escaping from this dualism uh, is possible by zooming out and looking at things on a larger scale. And in that sense, I believe that this planetary approach is uh, uh, is perhaps working uh, because then uh, suddenly what seems to be crucial differences on a small scale, if you zoom out, it becomes more blurry and more the same. Uh, regarding this uh, methodological question, that's a, that's a very good one. Um, my aim is to do two things, basically, is one to uh, look at the conventional highlights of modern architecture through another lens, through this lens of uh, climate change, and uh, give a different assessment of the buildings that are praised for their, uh, let's say, spatial, formal, technological uh, inventiveness uh, and see them through this lens of their relationship with the environment. And the second part is that, and this is relating to what you were saying, is trying to find, uh, let's say, figures that have been, or projects or moments that have not been uh, highlighted yet to give them more prominence. And I think you can find that in this uh, thinking of Marsh, uh, in uh, the uh, awareness of the climate of uh, Ruskin, who was not just this kind of pre-modern uh, 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 eccentric, but I think he was really onto something. Um, I think there's also a very interesting moment, and that's the where you can already start to expand modern architecture, this interesting moment where you can say, that I believe that it's mainly through their colonial experiences that uh, Western architects became aware of the factor of the climate. That uh, so it's a kind of uh, paradoxical effect of uh, colonialism that this it led to this uh, climatic awareness, and I'm actively looking for. Uh, perspectives from outside the, uh, the the Western canon to to include as well, and I, I think particularly in Latin America there were a few quite a few architects who were really dealing with the climate, just like in India. Um, so I think it's uh, it's going to be a small book because otherwise I will spend the rest of my life writing it. Uh, but but it, it will be an attempt to at least open the eyes for this different perspective. So it's the kind of re-reading of the conventional highlights, plus the beginning of a kind of alternative way of describing the history of modern architecture with Ruskin, with uh, Reclus, with uh, Patrick Geddes, 
uh, with uh, Lewis Mumford, who was always seen as a bit of a kind of a conservative voice within the world of modern architecture, but I think he's super crucial in the story about this relationship between architecture and the environment. I will give more uh, prominence to uh, uh, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright, his uh, broad acre city and his idea of the disappearing city, I think is much more important than um, uh, is often seen. Uh, I would go for more attention for the late work of uh, Ludwig Hilbesheimer, not for his early work with his high-rise city and this kind of uh, modernistic image, but his later work where he was dealing with yeah. the pollution and how cities had to be reformed to deal with industrialization. Um, so, but 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 you're totally right. This is the kind of uh, methodological uh, uh, conundrum to find a, a kind of balance between rewriting the conventional history and being more inclusive. But then thanks uh, to this kind of growing body of global histories, I think there's quite a lot for me to uh, to uh, to build upon. So let's see. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Hans. Thank you very much, uh, Hans. I guess, uh, well, it's almost uh, dinner time uh, in Italy, a lunch time in Memorial, yes. isn't it? <laughs> okay. So we can, uh, I guess, uh, Sarah, if you want to add something, I want to give uh, a thank for uh, to, to us for being here. It's a deal that uh, we have to, to meet in uh, Piacenza when it's possible in the, yes. next, <laughs> in the next years. Oh. And, uh, and maybe I think well, uh, and we need a copy for of your book for uh, our library also. As soon okay. as it's out, you will get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank okay. you very much, and uh, good luck with the continuation of uh, the workshop. See you soon. See you. Thank bye. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye, Hans. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye, you. bye, everyone. Bye.